listening to the voices behind Women's Cricket Chat. That's Alex, Hannah, Georgie and Cassie. Coming up on today's podcast, we've got umpire of the moment, Anna Harris. Now, Anna was one of the faces of the 100 umpiring and we spoke to her about her journey into umpiring and how she manages to balance that alongside her degree. We also chat to Anna about her mum getting her into umpiring and did somebody say umpire tiktok just a note to say that this was recorded before anna made her international debut as an umpire so yeah lucky for all you listeners joining us today we have anna harris umpire extraordinaire so welcome to women's cricket chat anna thank you i'm very happy to be here oh stop it you want to always start with flattery, it gets you everywhere in life. This is 26 years later and I have learned this one. <laughs> so obviously we got in touch with you because you are the umpire of the moment. You're gonna you're you and Sue, you know, wonderful Sue. Um, and you've been umpiring away all summer. Could you let us know just like how it all started and how you got into it in the first place? Yeah, so it started, so I did my umpires course when I was about 16, I think, so it came about, I was playing women's cricket for my club, and my mum started umpiring on the Sundays, because she thought, I can do better than half the umpires you have, Uh, and then eventually she said, well, why don't you do your umpiring, you enjoy cricket, so why not earn a bit of money doing that, Um, and then that's how it all started, really. And obviously, you did end up umpiring in the hundred in the inaugural 100, I should say. When you got the call to say, oh, we want you to umpire at the 100, what were you, What was your initial reaction? I thought they were sort of pulling our legs. So we'd been told there was maybe a bit of a chance that we'd be involved in it. So with the sort of the group of us who'd been doing the Hey Ho Flint and the Charlotte Edwards Cup, we thought, oh, maybe we'll get to be fourth umpire for a couple of the games, great experience. And then they said, oh, actually, you're all going to be on, like most of you are going to be on field. And then you're going to be doing loads of different games. So it was amazing. And then came the secondhand wave of, oh, my goodness, I've got to learn DRS. So, yeah, it was awesome. It was mega. Um, it was just another like way of looking at cricket and that level of scrutiny and the stepping up. And obviously you got to umpire alongside some of the absolute legends of the game. What kind of experience was that like? Did you feel you were really learning from them as you went along? Yeah, definitely learning. There's a lot of field craft that happens behind the scenes that you pick up from more experienced individuals. And also you learn that the serious faces on the pitch are actually really lovely people. So having the comms in your ear, you can be almost chatting absolute rubbish during the game just to keep each other going. Or like I fell over a mat if you didn't see and my colleague was laughing down my ear. So it's just like nice to just really enjoy your cricket. And obviously the 100 is such a new concept What was it like for you having umpired in the Hey Ho Flint and the Charlotte Edwards Cup to then going into 100 and, you know, having white cards to wave and all that? The white card. I think that's the main thing people have taken away from it. The biggest challenge of the white card, putting it back in your pocket, especially when you've then got a signal power play. Um, Yeah, it was mega. So quite a few of the players were the same which was a massive advantage because you know them from the other competitions obviously them have some of the international stars coming in which was awesome so sort of names that I've only ever seen on tv are suddenly standing like 10 feet away from me uh, so yeah it was it was amazing the crowd that was there was just unbelievable it brought a whole new experience to umpiring with loud crowd noise um and yeah just loved it and obviously you're still very young and you've grown up watching a lot of these players throughout your whole life, really. Um, what was it like to actually be in charge of them and be like, I'm the authority figure here? I'm lucky in the sense that quite a few of them know me from my playing days. And I've been sort of transitioning into doing slightly higher level umpire in the past couple of years. So I, they've had that sort of time to get used to not Anna the player, but Anna the umpire. But actually, it's very much an umpire's role is not to be, it's not your game as the umpire. You're there to help facilitate the player's game. So if I can get through a game with no one noticing me, big tick, job done. Um, but it was funny, some of them like comments about when I was playing or whatever, and you have a bit more of a laugh on the field because you've got that relationship with them already. But I definitely did get the mick taken out of me. First for the one at Lords where I nearly got hit and secondly for tripping over the mat. 
And you are our second umpire to guest feature on the podcast. First was, of course, Sue Redfern. And we asked her about the transition of being a player and then going on to umpiring. What was it like for you? And do you feel like having played cricket, even just at like grassroots level, that's kind of helped you understand umpiring a little bit more? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I still play as well. So I'm actually probably one of the worst players that you have to umpire because I know my laws and I know how to toe the line. Um, So I will hold my hands up and say I'm a nightmare to manage as a player. Uh, But through umpiring, you learn, you know, things like player frustration and quite often something that you could, you know, be really quite strict to them about. You go, right, look, I'm not happy with this, but I understand where it's coming from. And you get that working relationship as well as having like much better field awareness where's the ball likely to be hit or if the batsman's shaping up you can start to duck already at square legs you know it's going to hit you so yeah there are definite advantages and do you feel that they both had an impact on each other you know one has helped the other definitely although I would say umpiring has made me a bit more of a prickly player uh, more difficult going oh isn't it this actually or is it this So, so but yeah no it can have positive impacts both ways for sure yeah, and when it came to umpiring in the 100 again, like obviously we talk about umpiring and you think, you know, you've got your six balls, you move your, whatever you're moving from your pocket to the other pocket or your clicker. You might have your champagne corks, you could have coins, you could have chocolate buttons, we could have any of them. Was it difficult to then move from it's not six ball overs, it's five ball set, but sometimes it's 10? Yes and no. So yes, in the sense that we had a bit more card waving and bowlers continuing and things like that signals wise um but no in the sense that I felt it was a relatively okay change for me because instead of clicking the balls on my clicker I just clicked overs because it naturally goes in tens so it's just getting those routines right it was then when I went and did a I say normal game of cricket a six ball over game of cricket during the hundred that I then started doing starting counting to five and then my colleague which was my mum at the time was going no Anna this is six balls today um but no it was fine just once you get your processes you just get back into the rhythm of things and obviously within the hundred it was 10 balls from one what's the word from one wicket yeah um how did you find that because I know some of the players uh Amara Carl one for one um during one game she wanted to change ends at after five balls and obviously it's different so how did you yeah. find that yeah so I think at the beginning it was confusing players a little bit you go that's five and then they'd all start running you're going no 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 come back come back um but from an umpiring perspective it was about the concentration for the extra four balls because although the bowler might be changing after five you're still there for the ten So it's about kind of resetting yourself for those five, even if it's the same bowler. But I think one of the main advantages was that it did go through the game a bit quicker. So I felt like that was massive for the fans, especially new fans coming in, having a fast paced game. And what would you say to those new fans who are excited by cricket, but not necessarily considered the umpiring side of it? Because you're not exactly, you're you're fresh out of the womb yourself. So you're not too far down the line. They could be you (laughs) in not that long. Yeah, I thought you were going to say, you're not the stereotypical umpire. Um, it just gave me a bit of a giggle. But no, definitely. So there's loads of young cricket official courses out there. Um, I actually helped run one of the ones in Bucks. Um, so it's now it's becoming more integrated, like with Dynamos. I think they do a little bit of an umpiring module. It just makes it more a normal part of the game. So it's not always a, oh, how would I? But it's more of an accessible thing. Because I think the more you present opportunities to people, the more likely they are to take it up. And it's the same with scoring as well. So they're like both introduction courses are free. I believe they're both online as well. So it's super easy to do. Um, And you could be earning like 20, 30, 40 quid on a weekend, which to me as a 16 year old was massive. And of course, you are obviously still quite young. You started when you were 16 and you are still at university. So how do you balance umpiring and uni work yeah so I'm lucky in the sense that university last year so I finished my second year and we still had a decent summer break so university finished and it was straight into cricket season I missed a few of the early stages because I had exams uh, because studying does have to come first at the moment but then once that had finished just get back into the groove of umpiring but moving forwards it'll just be discussion of the university card have been great 
about managing that workload and fitting in the benefits of recorded lectures. You can watch them at 9pm at night if you want to. So yeah, we'll be able to get it sorted. And I mean, you're not just doing any degree. You are a medical student. So, you know, it. it's not just my one hour a day that I used to just do for my bed while hungover. You're, you're studying to do something incredible there. So maybe one day we could see you umpiring and then you could you could be a medic on the side. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not in the same game. Uh, that would be something gone wrong. But yeah, definitely. A um, little bit of a warning. If you do hurt yourself in Cardiff in the first eight weeks of term, you might end up with me putting a cannula in. So stay clear from Cardiff. And is is the dream to then be a doctor from there? You're going surgeon, you're going GP, or have you not thought that far yet? I'm thinking hopefully emergency and pre-hospital with the end goal being like the flashy everything, air ambulance, swooping in, helping out the paramedics on scene, things like that. Um, but we'll see. Maybe I'll have a fear of flying in helicopters. Things could change. And if you were to achieve your medical dream, would you still continue umpiring or would you just kind of do it every now and then as a bit of fun? So I, I love my umpiring as well as I love my current career choice. So it would be another balancing act, but I've been doing that for however many years. So it will just continue try and fit in as much as we can of both. Um, but yeah, I love, I love working for the NHS, but I also do love doing umpiring. Well, I guess they sort of help each other because it's all about concentration and making the right decision. Um, I mean, the consequences are slightly different, but (laughs) always thinking of the transferable skills. Definitely. You learn a lot about patients and speaking to people and being calm in stressful situations, both in umpiring and in working for the NHS. So they definitely interplay well. And that's patients with a CE as well as patients. (laughs) Definitely. A lot of patients with a CE is required. Yeah. And so this year you definitely you did make history as well. We can't ignore that you were part of the the all girl power team alongside Yvonne Dolphin Cooper um, at the ECB Premier League in Bristol. What was that like? It was awesome. Um, Yvonne's great. I've known her for a few years. She knew me since I was a lot shorter than I was when I was playing. Um, And yeah, it rocked up. The guys were lovely on both sides and they were going well how come it's taken this long? We went, don't ask us, but it's great that it is happening. Uh, and I think we've seen now, I forgot the name of the cup, but in uh, the Yorkshire area, two women just stood in the cup up there, which is amazing. Um, Joanna Bitson and Jane Pratt, I believe, don't quote me on that directly. So it's starting to see change across the country with women being taken more seriously and showing that we can perform at the level that we've been saying we can perform at for years. Um, and hopefully it will lead to more women taking part, young girls as well, because again, the more you see, the more role models you have, the more exposure you have, the more likely you are to do it yourself. And that's so important. You have to be it. You have to see it to be it, be it to see it, all that uh, fun jazz. And in terms of umpiring, do you have any dreams for the future, perhaps umpiring an international uh, game on the women's side or the men's side, or even a test? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I don't know whether my body could cope with five days. I don't have to pack the ibuprofen. Um, that's bad at 22, isn't it? Um, I feel like 22 going on 90. But no, definitely an international would be amazing. Um, probably more on the women's side, because I think have, knowing the players and just loving that part of the game, it's amazing to stay involved in it and give something back to the sport. Talking of giving back to the sport, we can't ignore the giving that was the TikTok of the umpiring <laughs> signals, which... It's something we need to see more of because people, sometimes people think of umpires, you know, your standard older man, he's just there because he doesn't want to run the 22 yards. So he'll just, you know, do his, do his bit there. What's it like to be the young person that's sort of the up and coming, you know, it's not just for old people. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, We started a TikTok account for Bucks, which is where that video came from. It's been a bit dormant recently, I must admit. Um, Umpiring sort of got in the way of things. But yeah, mum and I were running that TikTok. So we do have a few ideas. So stay tuned. There might be some more videos coming soon um, and hopefully getting some more material out there because we've got to adapt to both cricket changing and society changing. So to get younger people in, we need to adapt to the platforms that younger people are using, which is where the TikTok dance came about from. I love that it's you and your mum together making TikToks <laughs> as well. And then on the concept of video as well, how would you feel wearing the umpire cam on your hat? 
Yeah, I think it'll be all right. I think people would then see, you know, when I am falling over, the ball was actually coming quite close to me. Um, but no, it is good fun. Uh, and it's definitely just engaging with the fans in another way. And if they can get the umpire's perspective, it might be able to sell cricket to them a bit more. Um, the amount of skill that's out there, it's the best view on the pitch. I mean, 22 yards away from possibly the best batter in, in the world. So, yeah, all for it. And you've talked about having relationships in terms of with the players. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a moment where it's been challenging for you because you know them to umpire them? And have they ever disagreed with your decisions? Uh, it's a good one. So it's about managing being a friend off the pitch and crossing the boundary and being the umpire on the pitch without necessarily suddenly being really harsh towards it. But like, I wouldn't be having a gossip and a natter with someone I've been gossiping and nattering with before the game on the field. Um, and there have been a couple of instances, you know, it's lighthearted sort of like, oh, you sure? And you go, yeah, off you go. And usually, you know, off they go. So it's fine. But it's, you know, things like if, if it had escalated, then we'd be having a different conversation. But no, thankfully, they've all been lovely about it. Have there ever been tough moments when you're umpiring luckily it's not like we see in some of the football games when they turn around and start pointing in your face but have you ever had moments that felt it made you feel somewhat uncomfortable as an umpire yeah there's been a couple um uh, one that comes springs to mind is there's a it's sort of gone down the leg side classic they flicked at it i think it's come off his pad they've gone up all the team for the court behind they've gone not out and they've all just stood there and looked at me I was like, well, this is a bit awkward because uh, I'm giving it not out. Batsman's not walked or anything. So I'm like, right, guys, get on with it. He's walking back, hands on hips, chuntering away. Doesn't actually ask me anything about what's going on. Chuntering all game. So eventually you just had to get the captain and be like, tell him to shut up or tell him to come and have a word with me. But yeah, it's just managing it in different ways. But it can be a little bit awkward sometimes when everyone's just looking at you and you're going, I've made my decision. And on umpiring, uh, you've talked about the hundred and the cacophonous noise how does it differ from like say you were with the 100 for the five weeks and then you then go back into the regional soft with the charlotte edwards cup and the rachel hey ho flint like what are some of the differences that you see in terms of crowd because i suppose with the regional soft you have a bit more time to think yeah and what i actually really enjoyed was my first game back after the 100 was at cardiff um, which was A, nice and easy because I can walk there from my house. Um, but B, we had a crowd in, but because there wasn't the loud music and there wasn't thousands of fans, you could hear the crowd a lot more and hear them saying, oh, that was a lovely shot and, you know, clapping and everything like that. And it just felt really friendly and really nice. Um, but then on the same, like, same, like, idea some of the crowds at the 100 were fantastic the shots that they were cheering the celebration for the wickets you could really feel the players building off it so as an umpire you have to try and zone out as best as you can when 15,000 fans are screaming um and it's also just about I got this tip from Sue just listen to the bat tapping on the floor because if you tune into that noise you're so much more in the zone of those 22 yards um that then you can try and block out some of that crowd noise and help you catch the little edges that you might not hear over all the fans so yeah that was a big one for me but both both sides of the game just fantastic to see fans enjoying their cricket and have there ever been any moments you're sort of almost tempted to join in with the excitement oh definitely there was a mexican wave going around and i thought oh would i get in trouble if it's square leg i lifted my white car or something in time with it um i didn't but um, it's definitely one, you know, you could you think about having a bit of fun with or should I make my white card more flamboyant, things like that. So, yeah, it was actually at two of the games I had friends there and I thought, oh, I'll stitch them up by pointing them out in the crowd because uh, it happened to be someone's wedding anniversary. And then they got me back by going, actually, we're just here to see Anna Harris on the field. So the PA announcer, when as an umpire trying to remain incognito at Lords with 15,000 fans, the PA announcer, Anna, give us a wave on the field. So I was like, oh, hi, everyone. And I didn't know where they were, so I had to do a 360 as well. So that was quite fun. But yeah, it's, it's fun to feed off the atmosphere. It's like you'd scored your 50. I know, I felt like an absolute hero. Thankfully, I'd made a good decision that day and DRS went my way. So that was even better. Um, but yeah, no, it was awesome. And talking of having a bit of fun and being inventive with umpiring, do you ever think, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pick a different way that I'm, I'm going to signal a four, but I'm going to make it fun or I'm going to have my Billy Bowden crooked finger. Do you think maybe I'll have my little thing or is it more focused on doing the right thing first? 
I think somehow subconsciously the Anna Harris nod has become a thing a couple of people are mentioning it on Twitter. So like when I'm acknowledging a score as signal, we're supposed to nod, say like, yeah, we've seen you wave it back and a few people picked up on it. So uh, now I get sent clips or GIFs of me just nodding. Um, but that's about as flamboyant as I've got with my signals. Um, so stay tuned. We may see something else appear. And um, you also play for Wales, I believe. I read yes. that somewhere. Um, how important is it to have the support of the Wales Cricket Board and the ECB with umpiring yeah they're mega so I've been trying to put my playing ahead of my umpiring because whilst I'm still 22 um I feel like I've got a lot more to give with playing um but they've been fantastic about when I have had big opportunities just saying yeah that's fine or like missing training sessions to go and do some umpiring stuff um so they're 100 percent behind me which is a massive deal and and also helping to engage with people within Wales as well as um, ECB about trying to raise awareness of female officials and get more people involved so yeah it's been really good can't complain. So looking ahead to the next year you're training to be a doctor you're putting cannulas in the people of Wales yeah um, and looking ahead to next year's 100 will you be putting your name down as soon as you can for that one? 100% if they'll have me I will uh, put my name in the hat um it was fantastic this year and I can't wait to see whether they take it next year really and for you personally how has it been going from sort of relatively unknown to now being recognized on Twitter being sent memes all that good juicy stuff yeah it's, it's quite funny um I thankfully I haven't seen anything negative about me which is always nice um, but just seeing people like again enjoying engaging one of them dropped me a message and said I thought you're fantastic today um, which was really kind to them so it's been a bit weird um, and I was recognized walking around the stands to find my partner in law so they went you just unfind the women's game I was like yes and then scuttled off before they could say anything else um, but yeah it's been weird but pretty cool and um, in terms of you and your partner that's Something that's very important within the women's game is equality and diversity and being accepting of everyone of all beliefs. Do you find that that's somewhat something that's really inclusive in cricket as a whole, in umpiring, in playing, you know, everyone's accepting of everyone? Yeah, definitely. And cricket's a game for everyone, no matter race, religion, sexuality, size, whatever other things as well, like disabilities and things as well. So it's, it's been really welcoming for me and I would encourage anyone to go and give it a go and if you go to a club that you don't feel welcome in I'm guaranteed there'll be another club that, that you'll love. Do you find yourself a sort of role model in that respect? I wouldn't put myself as a role model I think I just live as myself and people can take from it what they will um, but there are definitely some other role models out there. And obviously the Rainbow Laces campaign is such a big and important thing do you think there will ever come a time where players don't have to, you know, wear the laces, they can just show their support no matter what? I hope so. I really hope so. Um, and it's like, I, I hope we don't need moments of unity in the future because whilst it does um, showcase that cricket is a really welcoming and inclusive sport, uh, I feel like we shouldn't need to tell everyone I like the rainbow laces. Um, but yes. Uh, Ready for my new pair of shoes. <laughs> But yeah, hopefully, I think as society, I think, is becoming slowly more progressive and accepting, I think we can begin to phase out these campaigns which have raised awareness and done lots and lots for people who are um, discriminated against. So I feel like we've covered a lot of the serious stuff, the umpiring stuff. What we love to do when we come to the end of these ones is to like do a bit of like quick fire personal fun questions. And we haven't got Hannah with us today, but she does have two favorite question one of them is quite difficult because as an umpire I can't imagine you sledge but what is your favorite sledge you've ever heard oh gosh that is a really difficult one the only ones I can think of is when I'm chatting absolute rubbish to my keeper at my club um the most famous one being talking about racing pigeons so much that the batsman kept turning around like what on earth are you want about um so I'm probably gonna have to go with that because I can't think of anything else and as other favourite one is what is your favourite tea item at like a standard village cricket tea? It's got to be scones and I say it as scone not scone 
uh, and I put my jam before my cream. So take with that what you will, but it's got to be a scone. Right there, jam before cream because you can spread jam and you don't exactly, like exactly. Scone has also been quite a popular answer for <laughs> this question, unless you're Izzy Wong, who actually named like a spoon and a mug. Oh yeah, we said what's your favorite tea item, and she thought we meant like a. <laughs> That's just Izzy Wong for you, really. She's um she's excellent. Yeah. Okay, so what was the last Netflix or Amazon Prime series that you binged or any platform? So I'm going to admit to it, it's a bit embarrassing, but Mum and I have really got into Married at First Sight UK. So I've been watching that recently. I did see that clip of the guy that looked like he'd fallen in love with the person. She was the bridesmaid. Yeah. yeah. I don't even watch the show and I thought <laughs> the Australian <laughs> version. The Australian version was fantastic and I was like, I need to draw the line. I can't get sucked in. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's definitely been my guilty pleasure. I've been binging that at the moment. And will you be watching Bake Off? I'm sure. I just can't get behind it now. Mary Berry's not there. Thank you. That's why I don't watch it on channel four. <laughs> I can't get behind it and I don't like adverts. <laughs> well, there you go. I actually really quite like Prue. But that's because she's got a bit of something, something, and she's a proper alchemist. Mm. So it's quite jokes. <laughs> um, what's your favourite genre of music? Or oh, probably like indie, rock, pop. I don't know. It's sort of a weird mix. I listen to pretty much anything, but I suppose you could go with like indie, as a guess. Favourite musician, if you have one. It's got to be Blocks. They're a really cool band. I really enjoy their music. And when you become a fully fledged doctor, will you be having a personalised stethoscope? No, um, I would With not a cricket have it. ball on it. Maybe I'll put a little cricket ball tag on it, but I'm not going to put Dr. Harris on it because I just think I'd cringe at myself. That's fair enough, to be fair. <laughs> um, Favourite or last book that you read? Oh, that's going to be quite tragic because it's the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine I was reading this today. <laughs> do you have um, a favorite book fiction book don't really reread anything but you can't go wrong with a trashy crime crime novel and does pineapple belong on pizza definitely not okay cats or dogs both i can't decide okay i'll give you that <laughs> favorite film uh pride Oh my gosh, that's a fantastic film. It's a cracker, it's a soundtrack. It? Oh, <laughs> what a banger. I'm going to see it on Netflix still. Great one. Um, um, summer holiday or cold holiday? Cold holiday. Dream holiday destination. I would love to go to Mexico. For the tequila? Partially. Or the Day of the Dead. I'd love to go to the Day of the Dead. That would be pretty cool. Both. Intriguing. And... Well, how old were you when you stopped believing in Father Christmas? I was quite young. I think I was about seven or eight. Well, I'm still going and I'm 26. <laughs> Favourite ground to have umpired at and why? Lords, because it's the home of cricket. Can't go wrong. Also, and lunches are spectacular. Oh, they are. And most iconic person you've ever given out? Izzy Wong, 100%. She's so funny. Yeah. Although Kate Cross did once describe her as a tennis ball. So you do okay. that what you will. <laughs> that was before the bright pink candy floss hair. I was going to say, was that the, the short hair? Nice. Well, I think we've exhausted all the questions. We know everything about you. <laughs> if you want to find out more, you follow me on Twitter and I'm sure I'll post something yes, equally that random. Actually, that is our... Usually our next follow-up is <laughs> Alex. So, yes. Anna Harris, umpire extraordinaire, where can our listeners find you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok with your mum, because we want that <laughs> going again, and any other platform you wish to share? Uh, Twitter is the main one I have people follow me on, um, a underscore Y underscore Harris, and then the TikTok, which is obviously the most important one, is at BucksACO. So you can find, hopefully, some more exciting videos coming up across the next year. Well, there you go. We can all get following then. Um, yeah, I think, thank you so much, Anna, for joining us and listening to us talk God only knows what for the last <laughs> half hour. It's been fab to chat to you and hear everything you're doing. And we look forward to 
seeing you umpiring, playing everything across the next year. I'm sure we'll see you at the 100 next year. So that's going to be fun. Hopefully. Um, good luck with the medical training because you guys are the stars. And we thank you, NHS, and everyone for everything <laughs> they're doing. Yeah, well, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you for inviting me on. We hope we were able to brighten up your day from the suck fest that is university. <laughs> I'm glad you clarified that that was to university and didn't just leave it at suck fest. But yes, oh, a bit death by PowerPoint today. Yeah, it's not great, is it? Well, thank you so much. And we will leave you to your PowerPoints. And I think I'll probably end up going to watch Pointless. Massive thank you to Anna for coming on and being a guest on the podcast. Um, we really appreciate it and we want to wish her luck for the rest of her degree. We're sure she's going to smash it and she'll find even better ways to be able to cope with being a world-class umpire and a medical student. And to all our listeners, if you want to keep up to date with everything we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter at WCricketChat on Instagram at Women's Cricket Chat. And if you want to give us a like on Facebook, we are Women's Cricket Chat. If you'd like to give our personal Twitters a follow, then it's at Hannity1194, at Georgia Heath27, at Cassie Coombs98, and I'm at Alex Jane Pereira on Twitter. This has been Women's Cricket Chat. Tune in next time.